very big welcome uh, to David Fox, who I'm sure if you're into your adventure games, you'll know the name, has worked on lots of uh, fantastic titles, uh, Monkey Island, uh, several parts of that series, uh, Thimbleweed Park, also done some interesting things uh, with the Rude Goldberg uh, uh, sort of, I don't know how to how, how I would exactly explain that, but he's going to done a game related to the kind of puzzles um, and, and works of Rude Goldberg, which we'll get into. And so a lot of things connected with theme parks, which I think uh, people might not know about as much as well. So this is kind of chatting about, about everything, really. Uh, and uh, anything people want to ask, please do drop it uh, in the chat. But hello, David. How, how are you doing, first of all? I am I'm good. I always good. get nervous at the start of these, and once I start talking, I'm okay. Oh, well, so do I, so don't worry. <laughs> and um, <laughs> You're fine. Honestly, you're with friends here. Uh, we all love your work, and um, yeah, n no no worries. Um, so I think I'll, I'll start with, and you did kind of ask yourself this question in the chat, so it feels right that we start with a question by yourself, but um, we will go back on your career and, 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 and what you've done um, from the beginning. But since it's only just recently been out, uh, it would be great to hear a little bit more about your work on Return to Monkey Island. Um, and the, the pertinent question is, when did you first hear it was happening and how were you told? Yeah, well, um, you at the beginning of the pandemic, we had a lockdown here in March of 2020. And I knew Ron was working on a game, or he was thinking about working on a game, but I, he told me nothing about it. So he asked me whether I'd be willing to help him test out a new engine that he was planning to use for this game for Dolores, the, the Dolores Free game that we down, that we created around March, April of 2020. And I said, sure. So you know, I saw the engine. It was you know very close to the, the way we coded Thimbleweed Park. Um, you know, it was maybe inspired by that and had some parts that were similar, but the UI was very different. So we did that, it was fun. And he said, okay, well, I am working on something. I can't talk about it now. Um, let's talk later. So somewhere, I guess in August, he scheduled a call with me I think it was in August. Yeah. And I had to sign like an NDA. I had to use blood. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, um, you know, he told me and, you know, my job dropped and he, he, he liked that. And, um, he likes it. What do you mean by that? What he, well, he liked that. He liked my reaction. I'm oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. I think he was, he was setting it up for the maximum reaction. <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah he invited me onto the project and found out at that point that he, he and dave grossman had already kind of been talking and working on the first parts of it for i guess eight or nine months um but it, it you know it wasn't until everything was you know finalized and, and you know contracts were signed that he could actually go forward um and talk about it yeah Yes. Yeah, and the part the part that I mean, I I knew that he wanted to do it, and you know we've talked about it before, but it was always that he would have to own all rights to the game to do that, and we all agreed that that would never happen because Disney would never sell anything that that they own. Um, so I kind of you know gave up on that idea maybe ten years ago, and as he probably did too, but things worked out, so got to do it. And I think I started officially, I can't remember if it was September, maybe it was October. I think it was September or October of 2020. So, yeah. And what was the process like working back on that? I've heard from quite a lot of people who worked on this project now, and I think a lot of them obviously say it was quite nostalgic and, you know, wanting to bring that to the game, but um, yeah, just interested in your experiences. Well, yeah, well, the, the first thing I wanted to say was that um, when Monkey Island 1 was being created, I had been moved up from being a project leader, designer, programmer, to being the director of operations at Lucasfilm Games, or LucasArts. Um, actually, I think it was still Lucasfilm Games. And 
so I did get to sit in on one brainstorming session for Michael Young and one, and I'm credited I'm in the credits because I was you know in like middle management for support. Uh, so I think all of us got some kind of credit, um, but I actually didn't work on it. And um, both the first two games I've always considered to be my favorite games, really. Um, so the chance to work on one actually was was really really exciting for me. Um, for for me, it was you know I I was the um, lead game programmer, which meant I really didn't do much in way of the design mm-hmm. that was pre- that was all handled by Ron and Dave. Um, but of course being on the team, you know, we were always able to give feedback and make suggestions. And when, you know, when you wire up a room, um, we had a lot of freedom to add stuff and knowing that some stuff will keep, will be, will make it through. Um, Dave often would edit stuff that I added and made it better, you know, bumped up the humor level. Um, he's a much better writer than I am. And, um, uh, we we had a very um, international team, you know, a couple of dozen people spread across the U.S. and Canada, Europe, and um, so we would have meetings in the morning um, in California time, say 9 a.m. Pacific time, which would be the end of the day for people in Europe, and and we do the, you know we, we use Slack for all meetings. And for most of our communications, and um, most, I think most of the people were people I had not worked with before. Uh, they were new, um, you know, very very different art style from Thimbleweed Park, so it required different techniques, different tools, um, and that was, you know, it, it was a fantastic team. Really, everyone was just really enthusiastic. I mean, it, you know, no one knew. You know, people were offered. A position on the project before they knew what it was. Yes, they had they hadn't been NDA'd until after they accepted. So the, um, you know, I guess they had interviews. They would talk about this unknown game. Yeah. Um, you know, if they accept it, it, was based on their knowledge of Ron's rep- reputation. Yeah, I guess that's what a lot of people went for, right? They were like, "Well, it's a game by Ron Gilbert." Yeah, I'm, I'm it, in. It be, yeah. It be, yeah, and it was an adventure. I think you know he mentioned that, but other than that, they had to, um, you know, accept it. Then they then they signed the NDA. Then they were told what the game was, and so I'm sure everyone had the same reaction. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and we knew about. I think you know questions like oh, what was your favorite game, things like that. So we knew what they knew about this, but that was very unusual. I mean, usually you know what it is you're signing up for. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I suppose for you then, I, I, I knew, I knew a little bit about how you said you, you kind of, you're credited being involved with Monkey Islands, but you, you know, you, you, you technically, you know, didn't, didn't work on it. What, what did that feel like then when, when you were invited to, to, to work on return? What, what, what feelings were you feeling? Were, were, you, were you worried about, you know, what you would, what you would bring, I suppose, you know, you, obviously you have what you did work with one and a lot of other projects, but I'm just interested in, because of its name, were, were you worried about working on this project that you, you hadn't before, or had you thought of ideas that would work with it that you were bring to the table? Yeah. Well, well, this, well, first of all, it was really different because on most of the other games I've worked on, um, either with Ron or, or in any case, I was always, if it wasn't a co-project leader, I was at least a co-designer um, or contributed a lot to the design. And that was true for Thimbleweed Park, even though the basic design was already set up between Ron and Gary Gary Winnick. Um, we, I was there for all the major uh, brainstorming sessions where we you know, go you know, a couple of days at a time and sit down and just whiteboard everything out and, and the specifics and work that out. So I was much very involved in that. Um, but here it wasn't. So, um, that was just, it was unusual. I, yeah, you know, it was actually very similar to Maniac Mansion in that way. Okay. Cause the, the, um, there, you know, we had to, it was a really 
really loose design there and it had to be filled all the all the gaps had to be filled in so this was similar to that but yeah for sure i mean knowing um how much people love the, you know the game how important it was and how secret i had to keep it too mm. i mean i couldn't the only person i could tell about this was my wife um that was as part of the nda she was included um but i couldn't tell my kids um my dog knew uh, but <laughs> <laughs> what's she your dog's really, name uh, Gracie, but she didn't, she didn't actually, um, seem to care that much about it, which, you know, I don't understand why, but, uh, um, so, uh, I think the burden was much more on Ron and Dave mm. because they're the ones doing the, the design, the, you know, the, the overall story and it was their reputation having created, you know, worked on the first ones. Um, that could be carried forward or, or, or not. Um, so, um, I, I don't envy them in that role. Um, that, that is, has got to be really stress inducing the whole time. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was, um, but on the other hand, once we were able to, you know, to spill the news, that was really exciting. Yeah. Um, I, I bet I can imagine. Um, yeah. w- you know, we we won't just talk about Return to Monkey Island, but um, uh, one one more question, I guess, around it is, um, just I, I suppose when when you were told about the when when you learnt about the ending and kind of ha- what what was going to happen with that, what what was your reaction to that? What did you think about it? Um, I well. Th- I'm not sure exactly when Ron knew how he wanted the ending. It wasn't definitely wasn't in the initial phase. Mm. Um, so it was something that he had um, talked about later, and you know wow. he actually wrote up a whole document that kind of said, "Here's here's what I'm suggesting," and he opened it up for feedback. And having worked on Thimbleweed Park, and I knew. Um, um, that this was likely that, you know, there'd be some twist or something unusual would happen there. Um, it, I, I probably, my style of, of stuff I would create, game I would create would probably would be much more straightforward. I mean, you could look at Zach McCracken and, and sure. of all the games I did at Lucas, that was really the only one that wasn't either based on a movie, ba- you know, working with someone else who had the initial design idea or, um, um, you know, where was my project and my original writing? And of course, I had, you know, spoiler, I had, a, um, you know, everyone lived happily ever after, yeah. except for the bad guys. So, I mean, that's my style of, of writing. And I know that um, I'm not a huge um, David Lynch fan because um, his stuff often has these kind of unknowable, like, endings that are that are um kind of aren't really set in stone you mm. know they're they could be interpreted in different ways um where i i like endings that are much more here's how it ends mm. and and you know so um so you know i i don't think i pushed back um i, I said okay this is you know pretty obvious this is how it's going to go and it's something unusual so, but I, I'm interested to know, did you, because obviously I, I think everyone had an initial reaction and then they maybe mulled it over. I know when I was speaking to Dave uh, Grossman, he was a bit surprised at the ending at first, but then when he kind of took it in, he had, he, he, he kind of, he grew to like it. I'm, I'm wondering if your first reaction was surprise or if you thought, oh, actually I was kind of expecting Ron to go with something like that or, or yeah, how did you react to it? What, it, what it were was, your initial thoughts, I guess? I was ambivalent at first yeah. um, and uncertain whether how it would work and when I finally got to the I actually I didn't actually play the game all the way through from start to finish until like maybe a month before release and you know I, I cried I mean I knew I knew it was going to happen I knew the code and just the impact of seeing it like that you know I, I cried at the ending too which is a common reaction that yeah. I've seen in so many people you know just hit you and it's very emotional and um a lot i agree with a lot of the reviews where 
you know, some people were unsure about it, but in thinking about it, they, they realized it couldn't have been any other way. Um, and um, I like that you have, if you don't like the exact ending you got, you can go back at the end and, and try a few other combinations of the words or things that you do. So maybe find one that's more to your liking to mm -hmm. say, that's the, that's the real ending. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can be happy about that. Um, and I, but as you said, it's, you know, you're, you're there kind of implementing, uh, kind of Ron's vision on this. I'm interested that you said you brought up <laughs> David Lynch. Cause when I spoke to him, he said he loved David Lynch. So I'm interested in, in the aspect of <laughs> what's it like maybe implement as a programmer implementing especially with adventure games when it's very much about the story implementing someone's vision that you are, are you know you've got a very different style to and 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 how do you do that yeah um you i mean part of the, the implied agreement i mean I don't know if we ever talked about this but it's like you know you know you know who what everyone's role is and if the designers want to go in this way, I mean, you could talk about it. And, and if there's a specific thing that you think should be softened or, or be made clearer, you could, I could bring it up. But um, there, I, I don't see, I don't think I saw any conflict where someone says, like, I'm not going to implement that or mm. you know, something like that. It can't do that. Um, it was okay. Let's let's go with it. Let's see how we can make it the best we can possibly make it. I feel like my my. One of my roles on the game is was kind of the was doing a lot of room polish, um, animation, um, triggering the animations to make sure they looked correct. I mean, I didn't do the animations myself, but you know, to make sure that they were implemented properly and the timing felt right, and um, so it felt much more like um, doing an implementation than going back and polishing and polishing everything until it looked good. It's like you know. When, when you have, for example, you have, um, I, I did a lot of lighting, um, making sure that the, the lights seemed to look good as you walked you know, the characters from different locations and would do a lot of tweaking and adjusting on those until they, and ideally, where you don't really notice it, it just mm. feels right. Um, things like when you have a character reach for something, um, we, had a com we had several different animations we could use. Um, and have to find that without having to do a, a special case animation for every time you pick up something off of the ground, you know, you just decide where, what's the best one that works, where do you, exactly where do you put the character? And yeah, I might spend five or 10 minutes, five minutes, say, adjusting the position that, um, that guy Bush might stand in when he has right. to reach down to pick up a specific object. So I knew where the object was. And I just keep on doing it, refreshing until, um, it looked like. It looked correct. You know, you don't want him to reach, you know, two inches away and have the object disappear. So, try to find something that that, that feels right. Um, and a lot of what I did was doing um, initial wiring of rooms where we get the art, um, and you know, marking where where you could walk, um, with the objects where initial reactions to each object that we were going to make hot, you know, turn into hot spots. And you know, choreographing some of the a bunch of the cutscenes so that you have the characters walking in the right place and where where they don't ideally don't walk through each other um, yes. during those. And which and is the one everyone always notices on these kind of things, isn't it? It's the oh, it's the one everyone always sees if, if something like that happens. Yeah, and I mean, you could still walk through characters in a lot of places, but didn't want it to be actually coded that way in a cutscene yeah. where people are going to see that over and over again. Um, I also got to implement the music. Um, so, you know, taking the music from the composers and popping into the game and triggering the different music events at the right time and the oh, cutscenes cool. and, and things like that was fun to do. Um, because I've, I, I wouldn't consider myself a musician, although I've played trombone throughout my, you know, since I was in sixth grade <laughs> and so I mean, that's quite musical that's you know a long time yeah, to... <laughs> but, but you know kind of super average in terms of where you'd be in a, on the the scale maybe okay. below average i don't know but but enjoying it when i was doing it um and and then you know 
a huge thing at the end was you know, bug, you know, fixing bugs. And, you know, there might be anything from there's a glitch when, when Guybrush reaches or something or, or, um, I can see him shift sizes, um, because he, he walked into a walk box area that had a different scale factor, um, or he wasn't actually supposed to walk into that. So just, you know, things that we had super great play test or testers on this that, that could just spot things and, um, work with us until we could duplicate it. And, and, you know, that was, what was the total number we had, you know, it was it 15,000 bugs. I don't know. It was some, it See, was some I don't huge... know. Cause I'm obviously, I'm not a developer and not in those side of things. Is that, a, is that a lot for a game or would that be considered okay, kind of I, an average amount or? Yeah. I see it was close to 13,000 somewhere in that ballpark. Um, I don't know if it, we're, where you would consider it on the average, um, way more than the last game I worked on, but it was also much more complex. Mm. And how many and do you have for Thimbleweed Park? Can you remember? I, I'm guessing it was less than half, but I don't okay. remember what the bug database was for that. Um, we all had a um, a pool in the beginning where we each, when we first came on the project, we would th put out a number of how many bugs we thought we would have. <laughs> And most of us were under, um, so that was kind of a fun thing. I, mean, I, I guess that could be self-serving. You go and, and keep on adding new bugs. That's true. New bugs <laughs> <and eat it. laughs> but <laughs> that didn't happen. That's good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I've kind of answered Pete's pieces of Kate first question, but they also asked another question saying, I noticed David had an additional writing credit in return. Uh, so which bits did you write? It's probably more... Um, wasn't really dialogues. Um, Dave did most of those. So it's probably um, adding reactions when you, for, for when you pick up objects or look at objects or look at objects maybe multiple times. Um, and so in, I, I guess I did, I did most of, I coded most of Melee except for the jail um, and, um, most of scurvy Island and one of the, the other, the, um, what's it called terror Island, um, was done by Lee. Um, so I didn't do that one. Um, I did a lot of the work on the, on Bermuda, Bermuda. Yes. Yeah. And, um, big chunk of time on the challenges and but again in those cases most of that writing was already in place so it's really more um you know your reactions to objects and combining objects and, and things so um you know not a lot but enough that i felt like it should be included yeah yes well i think so um, yeah credits were credits due um did, did you have, did you have a favorite bit of it to to program was there a particular mm. bit you enjoyed the most well, I, the, I can tell you which piece I was the most troublesome. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I um, love how you turned that around. Yeah, let's uh, yeah. hear this. Because, <laughs> I mean, I feel good about it now, but I just remember, you know, the, the whole bit with in the museum with having it to steal stuff. Yes. And the timing and getting it to work and um, getting it so, I mean, that there's often, in, in most games, there's like one or two areas that are the most troublesome where they keep on coming back with, with, more and more, you know, with bugs, you fix something and there's another little one that shows up or there, they find some unusual way of doing something. Um, and having to go back into the code and protect against that without making something else break is really mm. hard. Um, so that area was really tough. Um, I think the, the eating contest, um, was really fun. Um, but it also, you know, the combinations of how you do it. I think initially we had a, a different, it was it was set up a little differently, so it was a little more complex. Um, but we did it so that you didn't have to, you know, was I think originally you, didn't, you had more freedom about what you picked up and and how you know what you could do with the fish. Ah, uh, yes. Um, but once we got that working, it was it was really good. It was fun. Um, I I enjoy um, 
I enjoyed a lot of the stuff with, with sound also. Um, you know, I didn't create the sounds. We had, you know, at least did most of those. Um, but wiring them in so they were triggered at the right time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that the, you know, when he goes, smashes his hand on the table, you make sure that the sound triggers at the right moment and getting that frame accurate. Um, that was really fun for me. Um, I, the whole thing in the voodoo shop was really fun. I think um, setting up the, um, oh, okay. We, we had a process where um, for the long cut scenes, um, we would first have them all storyboarded and um, kind of we would animate the storyboards so mm. you actually get the different frames at the different time. And then, you know, since story, you know, creating the storyboards are really rough, they're, they're, we just basically have them scanned in and then dropped into the game at the right, po at right point. And that would give us a way to um, fine tune the, the dialogue around that and the timing and decide, well, we really don't even need that, th those shots, but we do need a new one that is, that's missing here to get all the beats right. Then it would go into, into actual animation. So kind of being able to go from temp dialogue to storyboards to actual um, animation was a really fun process to watch that. And then, you know, then later on dropping in the music for that and triggering that. So just, you know, seeing the, the levels of polish that would, that, that you would get to do without putting a lot of energy into, you know, creating something which would eventually get cut. So there wasn't mm. all, all that much got cut uh, because we would, we would do it pretty carefully like that. Yeah, I mean, and you can see then why you know that that you know it sounds like like you said there was a lot of lot of different layers to each bit. So I, I guess I can see why in that case there were you know bugs that were discovered because you know it, it sounds you know pretty complex in in, in that mm -hmm. case. Right. Um, we if anyone has more questions about return, very, feel free to like drop them into the thing. But we'll kind of move on a, a little bit now and talk about other stuff as well. Um, and I guess just going back to um lucasfilm which obviously then became lucas arts i'm i'm just interested in uh maybe first of all just hearing any any sort of fond memories of that time or um just in, in general what you know you what you thought about it well i mean it's going up to even how i got the job yeah um the the um my wife and I, we, we already lived in marin county so we were in the right place and um the my wife and I had started this public access microcomputer center in 1977, you know, like a couple months after Star Wars came out. And I was aware that a lot of the production was being done um, locally, that they, were, that they were based in, in our county. Um, and I mean, there was a point where we were, we really wanted to buy a house and we know we knew what the property costs were here and we started thinking well maybe we should move somewhere else and like maybe go to eugene oregon and and try a place where, where the housing prices were like a third or half of what they were in our county and we we took a trip and you know saw a bunch of houses and i was starting to feel sad and um i finally identified that it was because if we had moved, I would never get to work at Lucasfilm. And so, so that was a dream it. for you then to yeah, do Yeah, it. it was. And I didn't see how I could because I, you know, I didn't do special effects. I, you know, I, I had no, as far as I knew, I didn't have any skills that I could ever end up working there. But I still had that as a, as a wish, a hope. And that was in 1979. So, um, was that because you were just into those type of games or I'm interested yeah. if you maybe didn't have those specific skills or, you know, uh, what, what, why was it that you wanted to work there? Yeah. But there really weren't any Star Wars games at that point. Right. Um, and it, I just, I guess I was so moved by the first movie that I figured, okay, I, I, I want to create something like that. I want to be involved in the creation of something like that. Um, so I started writing while I was still at the computer or computer center, I, I started writing some books on programming, um, you know, kind of beginning texts. 
And the third book I wrote was on computer animation and, um, how, you know, part, you know, what, what the state of the art was at the time, but also how to do it on your Atari 800. And I was able to get access to the, the computer, Lucasfilm computer division people in that group and got to know several, several of the people there. They, um, Alvary Ray Smith, which is, who was one of the co-founders of it, offered to proofread my animation book um, to make sure we got the technical information correct for the state of the art stuff. I got, I got a bunch of imagery from um, some of their work, including um, some shots from Star Trek to Wrath of Khan for the Genesis uh, effect and put those in the book. And um, the, I was doing that in 1981. And around the time I finished my manuscript, um, one of our members of the computer center, who I knew, happened to work at ILM. And um, I think he was the one responsible for creating the Go Motion setup using an Apple II and moving the dragon and Dragon Slayer. And so he, I mean, I got to visit him there at ILM and see what he showed me how his setup was. So I had this, we had like peripheral connections through those two different means. So he came into the computer center and said, hey, did you hear that Lucasfilm was gonna start a games group? And I said, what? And so I immediately called up um, Ed Catmull, who was the head of the computer division and asked, um, so I'd love to interview for a position for this. So, okay, well, we just hired our general manager for the group. And as soon as he starts working, I'll have him bring you in. So I got to come in. I had this, my manuscript, you know, thick manuscript on the computer animation featuring the Atari 800. And coincidentally, um, Atari was funding the, initial, the start of this group with the idea that they'd get first rights of, of any games that we did for the Atari 800. Um, so I, had, I was in the right place. I had I knew the, some people already. Um, my book was on the on the computer that we were going to be programming for, and um, I guess oh the other thing they were looking for were people who were not already in the gaming in the gaming industry. Oh. <laughs> um, so I have, had avoided joining any other game company, which was a plus because they didn't want any kind of established. Um, bad habits or bad way of thinking okay, got you. or alternate. They wanted to kind of reinvent how games are going to be done. Um, so I got hired. I, so I, I was the second after Peter, who was the manager, second outside person who's hired, but the third actual person, because one of the guys came over from working on the laser printer um, in the computer division, jumped over to our group instead. So I was there at the very beginning. Um, and um, I really wanted to do a Star Wars game and found out in the first year or two I was there that we couldn't because all the rights to Star Wars games had already been sold to other companies. So we weren't allowed to do any anything in the Star Wars universe um, until I guess those rights had terminated, I guess, yeah. maybe okay. nine, eight years later. And that's so. I think the first game that we did, I wasn't involved with, was the I think Rebel Assault. Um, that was like early 90s. Um, and uh, I forgot what your original question was. I knew how to do it. <laughs> so I no, I mean, it, that's kind of filling in what I was just sort of saying. I was interested, just it was a very vague question, to be honest. It was just asking about your memories of the, of the time and if you had mm. any sort of favorite. Uh, memories of what it's been like because I've, I've spoken to you know quite a few people now fr from that era and a lot of it to be fair quite a lot of it has been you know how they got the job and it's all been quite different um, takes in it but I guess what was it just like working there as a company what what did it what what did it feel like um, well everyone was really nice um, I had massive imposter syndrome whatever you call it um, yeah. so they're going to find out like any day now that I shouldn't they shouldn't have hired me <laughs> Um, and, um, I think on my first game, it was like maybe six months into the project when I, when I actually realized I was the project leader. Um, I mean, I, guess, I know it was my idea and I was kind of organizing it, but I hadn't understood what, what, because maybe because I never worked in a game company before, I didn't understand that there was a lead that, you know, what the different roles were. So I kind of, I 
that was kind of like, oh, okay, I guess that's true. I guess I am. Um, the obviously the the time I think we were at Skywalker Ranch for about four of the years I was there, and that was um, pretty amazing. Um, I love giving tours. Um, so when we had guests over, we usually set it up for a lunch and and a walk around tour of the ranch of the different parts of the ranch. Um, working on when I was working at Labyrinth. Um, huge highlight was a bunch of us going to London and brainstorming with Douglas Adams for a week um, for the, you know, for how we could take elements from the movie and put them into the game. Wow. Uh, that was really exciting. What was uh, that like meeting him? Uh, he, he was just so, oh, it's, he had so many great ideas and he was just, you know, also really humble um, and just, you know, we just sat down and worked, got together. And unfortunately I, I had read all the hitchhikers books at that point, at, up to that point and was like in awe of him. Mm-hmm. And I felt like, you know, kind of like I couldn't, I couldn't talk. <laughs> I kept on fumbling whenever I talked. So I mostly, my, my role was more taking notes and, and oh. adding a few ideas, but I felt like, um, um, I was kind of, I uh, felt awkward, um, um, having, you know, he invited us over to his house for dinner one night and he and his, his partner made the food for us. And, um, Jim Henson was invited and sat across from me at the table ah. and, um, that, because he was the, the director on, on the film. And, um, I just remember eating my pasta, whatever it was we had. And every once in a while I would hear Kermit the Frog <laughs> in the room with me. And I'd look up and see Jim there. And I was just like a, a weird, yeah. you know, super strange reaction. Um, uh, the, the, when I first started working there, I actually told um, Peter that my... Um, my actual desire was to work on kind of like immersive location-based type entertainment or theme park stuff. And I had, you know, was envisioning like eventually doing some kind of a long form immersive experience where it might be multiple days or at least a 24 hour period where you're actually in this simulation of some sort. And we had, you know, had a project at at the computer center where we, where we talked about how could you actually do that? Um, not realizing that how many millions of dollars you would need to even to even get anything completed. Um, so our five thousand dollar budget wasn't going to be enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, but I told him that that's what I wanted to do, and he said, "Okay, well that's that's great, but we're going to do home games for right now. Maybe someday in the future we get to do it." And that actually did happen um, for my last two years at the company where we, we were working on this, um, we had a new group, very small group, and we worked on this project called Mirage, which was you know, like a state-of-the-art simulator. And I got to take um, my first game, Rescue on Fractalus, which is a point-of-view flight game, and then adapt parts of it um, and have it actually be in the Star Wars universe. So you you were flying in a two-seat, two-seat, um, pod with a massive um window out in front um with a mirror behind you know out, out there so you're actually focusing on a mirror so it looks like everything you're looking at is like 100 feet away from you rather right. than just close so you feel like it's flying through this big expanse and we use an amiga as our heads down display but used like million dollar image generator from evidence and sutherland for the um create the three video projector views out the window that are all kind of blended together so you don't see the edges and you know surround sound and and it just you know super amazing you know, amazing game to actually play and it was you know multiplayer so we had other computers uh, stations that were connected to it so you could actually do dog fights with wow. like swimming tie fighters um and of course you know full frame rate you know stuff you could do now pretty easily on any any that you know and have it look much better now on on like a Nintendo 
a, a switch or on on your on your iPhone or you know anything. Not not to mention on a PC with a high end graphics card. But back then it was like super expensive. And after two years, I think they realized that they um, had a problem with how could you actually sell this? Would any theme park actually want to pick it up? Mm. And the project closed. Mm. And so, but but now um, Disney kind of did what we were imagining with their star starship hotel um that you can you know go for a couple nights and be in a totally essentially on a starship with all the views out the window or you know space and they have action things that happen during the time you're there and a shore excursion and um so someday i'd like to do it but i don't have to worry about um being masked up the whole time right yeah yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll go back to gaming and stuff, but since you brought up the kind of sort of theme park side, you you did do something called the Leonardo Challenge at, at Disney Tokyo, at, at, I think at the park called Disney Sea. So tell yeah. us a little bit about that. What What is that and uh, how, yeah. how did you design it? Well, um, Jonathan Ackley, who people know from, was it Monkey Island 3, right? Yes, Curse of Monkey Island, yeah. Yeah, and and we actually worked together. We never worked together at Lucas, but we worked together at another company for a period and got to know each other. And then he, after he left Lucas, he had another job. I think he was at Lego um, doing the you know the robotic stuff. And then he, went, then he went on to Disney to work in their Imagineering team. And he was trying to get them to do a lot more interactive stuff at the parks and no one there had any interactive experience. So he got permission to, to launch a project to, to do a test and it, at Epcot uh, based on the Kim Possible animated uh, series, a TV series. And it was all, you know, interactive in that you'd have a, like a, a, a phone or something equivalent to a cell phone because this is early in the day. So they, you, they had to decide which ones to use. I think it's before iPhone. And um, it just, you know, people responded to it and they liked it a lot. So they said, okay, let's do this in all the parks. So he called me and Annie up, um, my wife, to do, um, to design some overlay games at uh, both Hong Kong Disneyland and Tokyo Disney Sea. And so we went there, spent time in, in those parks and came up with a bunch of designs. And the only one that went forward was one for Tokyo Disney Sea, which um, you know, we came up with a story. We had the basic gameplay where it was, basically it was like it was like a treasure hunt. We were going through different things, with different areas with picking up clues to, about where to go to the next one until you finally get to the final stage and then you, you win. And. Um, so we did the design, initial design, and then we're off the project and Jonathan kind of cleaned it up and actually had to, I think, make it simpler without all the tech that we had added in there. But the basic story was still the same, which is fine. And like 10 years later, actually, you know, we were in, in Japan again for fun this time. And actually, I got to go to the park and actually try it. Jonathan gave me you know, translation so I could understand what each step was actually yeah. saying. And you know, that was that was exciting. So it's still there, um, as far as I know. Um, but, but it's you know, it's very low tech. They're they're you're basically using a map to one of four maps I think that you could pick up to walk through this amazing space they already had um, that looks very much like being in the buildings for Mist for the original game. And, you know, very Escher-like stair, stairways that kind of go all over the place and you have to kind of figure out where you are. So it's, it's very maze-like, but open and it, it kind of in a renaissance feel. And in fact, I think the people who designed that area were huge Mist fans also. So that became, um, that's why it seems so familiar when we saw it. Um, so that, I would love to do more of that, but the opportunity to do it hasn't arisen mm -hmm. yet. The ones we designed for... Um, Hong Kong Disneyland never were implemented at the time. Um, so, you know, it could still happen, I guess. I don't know if they, if they throw, they don't, I don't think Disney throws stuff away. They might come back and say, hey, didn't we have something about, you know, some design to do something like that? Um, so that was that was that part. Um, and, I, you know, I also 
was really interested in virtual reality back in the um, early 90s when I was still at Lucasfilm and I was able to research and see things and, and try try it out in its earlier stages before before it was really very good at all. Yeah. And, you know, where the frame rate's really slow and there was like tremendous lag when you move your head around. And mm. um, so I, the um, Rube Goldberg game, um, be, this is before Thimbleweed Park. It actually came out nine years ago. Um, but we did, we, Unity um, ended up having a short-term group that they set up called Unity Games, where they were going to fund several groups to do original games that would be, you know, sold through through Unity uh, or through, I guess, through Steam in this case. But um, so we did it for, um, you know, I found. Um, but before that, I found, I decided I wanted to do kind of a chain reaction style game and start searching for Rube Goldberg games. Because I remember reading his cartoons from the, when I was a kid in the, in the 50s. And um, he, for those who don't know him, he was an American um, cartoonist who is hugely popular in like the 1930s and 40s, mm. mostly known for his crazy chain reaction contraptions yes. which always are way more complicated to do something simple you know, like you know simple way to close a window and you have like 10 steps of things that you have to enter you know create so I, I found the Rube Goldberg website and reached out to them and the next morning got a call from his granddaughter who is running the group and we set up a, a agreement where I'd have access to all of his cartoons and oh, I could wow. choose what I want and I want, my idea was I would take his pre, his old cartoons, you know, um, I think we did 12 of them and basically implement it into like a, like a puzzle where we would take most of the items out of the room, put them into your toolbox or your inventory okay, and yeah. you'd have, you'd have to figure out where they go to get, get the final result and, you know, tie, th tie things to get together with strings have you know there's usually one or two animals in each one of them get have them coded so we ended up of course we had to use unity um to do it and um we uh, it came out it was you know i thought it was really good it's never a huge hit but i had really a, a lot of fun doing working on it but more recently i wanted to see if we could adapt that to vr since we already were it was already in 3d essentially in, in unity so I started working on that for the um, Oculus Quest and the, now the MetaQuest and got pretty far along in the project when the McAllen game came up and I just had to park it and focus on that instead. Mm. So we're kind of going back to that and trying to you know, finish to clean it up and get it get it out. Um, so that's that was the, my figuring that was a, a really good way to get into you know VR without having to start with a huge budget and create all the new assets and scenes and everything. Uh, David in the chat asks, uh, did your team or did you rig up any Rube Goldberg machines in the office for a laugh to, to test uh, it all out? No, it's, it turns out it's <laughs> so much more difficult to do one in real life than yeah. it is on a computer. Um, there is a guy named Joseph Hersher who is probably the, the best Rube Goldberg creator of present time. Um, and he actually was just starting out at the time that we started doing our game. So he, he came on as a consultant and actually helped design three of the levels. Um, I think the, the first 12 were based on Rube's cartoons. The last six, we reused the assets and came up with new original puzzles. And he did three of those. Um, but he's just amazing. You should check out his YouTube channel. Okay. I think it's called Joseph's Machines. Um, and they're hilarious. they're hilarious. And he he has to do them in real life. And he usually shoots them all in one take. So they're actual proper, proper Rugobi machines rather than having, you know, multiple shots to edit together to make it look like it's working cor uh, correctly. Um, but I know from, uh, and, and because of that, I was also a judge for about six years at the Rube Goldberg contests. Ah, 
and saw how difficult it was to have these college students transport their device, the machine, to cross across state lines and get them set up so you, so you could actually get them to work. And, um, you know, how many times do you have to actually do, do a touch or an assist to get the thing going again? Mm. And just super difficult. So, so the answer is no. <laughs> Um, I suppose it, it just hearing you say that it sounds like it's a bit like programming in a way because you've got to get everything right in the right order and make sure you know it all works together as one. And if you take out one element, then it's going to stop everything else. Yeah, well, it's worse than that because there's a random randomness. Like if you place a ball in one place and it's off a fraction of a of an inch, um, it may not work the way that it had ten other ten other times you did it. Um, I, I see that um, there's some links in the chat to to Joseph's channels. Yeah. So if you want to check those out. Yeah, I definitely will because that, that, they, they look amazing. Um, maybe um, just as we finish this. Um, Duke of Germany asks a good question. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what makes the Dinky engine special um, and or highlight some of its features? Well, it's very much like Scum was. Yeah. Um, and of course, Ron created Scum, um, and he also created the engine we used with him when we park, and then this one, the, the Dinky one. Um, it's, you know, it, if you look at the code, you could, it's pretty clear what's happening um, in, in both of them. I mean, you, you could read through the code and actually imagine how the characters are moving around, what they're doing, what their animations are, because it's all very, you know, it's all clear. Um, but it's, you know, it's a C. I guess a C like language, you know, where you have if then else and and variables and all that stuff is, you know, easy to see. Um, you know, that, that you know, creating fun, you know, it's multitasking like or like scum was where you could say have one script that's running, which is com you know, controlling like a clock or, or doing something like that, or waiting for some you to get close to some area to, for something to happen. And um, it's just, pretty powerful but also easy to program it and you know it may i mean i've looked at some of the current adventure gaming engines and some of them i think are much more um connecting up you know different events together graphically like with, with arrows connecting things and i always found that much more difficult than just coding it um, this way. So um, I prefer this because that's how I learned how to do adventure games was, you know, with that kind of an engine. Um, I don't know if there's anything really unusual with it. Um, in, in, in the game, we used a couple off the shelf products to, like for, for sound, we used F mod and for animation, we used spine um, so we didn't have to create those. We just had to, you know, wire that you connect, you do all the connections so they would work in code. Um, and we all, and we just used, um, most of us were using, um, like sublime text as a text, as a text editor. Okay. Um, yeah. And I think in Slack for communication and then, you know, using Git and X version for storing image for Git for storing the code and X version for storing um, the um, the room the room files and animation and um, so you know not super magical it just worked you know mm -hmm. I mean on the other hand it's always difficult to write a game in a in a new engine which is still um, changing as you're working on it. Um, so you, know, you never know whether the bug that you're seeing is your bug or a problem with the engine. Um, that so that takes longer to get that to work right. I'm but interested I, in. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, if you. I, I was going to say that because Ron released the code for Dinky. Yeah. Let me say for for Dolores. Um, you could you know go to his you know to search for Dolores Dinky and you'll go to GitHub and you can actually pull the code. Not for the engine, but for the game, the game we did. So you can actually look at the dinky code that was done there. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I'm sure there'll be some people in the chat that'd be interested in in doing that. 
Um, yeah, sorry, I, I was just going to say, um, and we'll move on to have a little bit. Uh, I, I, I'm conscious that we spoke to you already for quite a while, so we'll, I'll have a quick chat about... Um, I guess I, I just wanted to know a little bit about have you returned to some of your LucasArts kind of uh, more retro games like Zap McCracken? Uh, um, and what do you think about them now, if you have? Um, well, I haven't played it. Um, I, I mean, when I've given talks, um, like we, I give it, we had a talk on the 30th anniversary for Zach in Italy. And so I had to go deeper into it and remember lots of parts of it and looking, you know, I just basically stole, you know, video from YouTube of people walking, you know, playing through it. And, <laughs> um, I, I'm pretty aware of, of, I mean, all the things that we were doing then to, make sure people got their money's worth in terms of playtime are now things which I realize are tedious and would not work in a modern game. Like, the like basis. the fact that you could, you can go through the game and end up, um, in no non winnable situations mm, okay, um, yeah. and have to start over and, and, you know, you know, use the knowledge you had to start over. That was okay. We, there, there was no, at that point there was no, um, it wasn't considered bad, bad form, or all the mazes that we had in the game um, caught to be tedious, but it extended game gameplay um, with very little graphical overhead, which was or, or space. You know that was a big issue. Was like how how could you, you know, squeeze this game onto one or two floppy disks mm. um, and have like 30 hours of gameplay? Um, and you have to have things like that to make it last. So, and Return to Monkey Island, you know totally the other direction where where we didn't want you to get stuck for for ever having to do something and you could always you could never get into a no-win situation you know either even if you do something um or forget something or do something wrong way there's always a way to go back and and get it without starting over um and just a different you know modern modern game design philosophy and and people's level of patience and frustration are very different now than they were back then um, could you see there being a Maniac Mansion sequel or even kind of a remastering in the works anytime soon? I know there's, there was sort of a jokey mention of it on Twitter, right. but right, you know, we still, I still get like people coming across those tweets yeah. and say, "Oh yeah, 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 let's do it." Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I specifically for Zach, um, having finished, you know, t for me two years on, on Monkey Island. And, um, the, it, it, fortunately I, I wasn't doing overtime. You know, I think most of my weeks were always like 40 hour weeks. Um, but very intense. Um, I mean, it's not like, you know, doing the work and then checking Twitter and going back and it was like, I'm on for that 40, you know, for the eight hours for that day to, to make sure that I'm, um, very focused and it, it's, 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 huge and, and i wasn't even responsible for the project so the idea of taking you know trying to take like a zach sequel or remake and what what would be involved in making that happen um is that something i'd want to commit to for the next two or three years and i it, it, i mean the, i love the idea of, of seeing it but i don't think i have the energy right now to do it i'm still you know recovering from the intensity for the last two years so mm, you know yeah i mean if someone came up and said we want to do this we'll fund it you don't have to do any coding um we just want your help on the design that would be a very different situation especially if i could i, I could have control over what actually did go in the final game but not having to actually project lead it i don't think i'd want to do that right now but i i, I can't say never because you know yeah. things things happen things change um, Kate in the chat says, what are your thoughts now about dead ends in games? W would you never do it again? I think it's more elegant to not do that. Um, you know, also the goal isn't to, I mean, I really like the balance that Mikey Allen came out with, with the new one, um, in terms of the amount of gameplay, the amount of frustration people have to have to deal with, 
that had yeah. more open endings, I guess, than than dead endings in a sense. It had yeah. multiple endings, but they were all very it, much open. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was pretty. I mean, if you look at the game, it opens up. It, it pretty much comes down to like a, a very small possible number of, of things that can happen at the end. Um, but it's, I think it's much more approachable than the old games that we used to do. I think anyone, you know, my grand, my eight year old grandson with a little help from his, his parents, um, who were actually play testers on the game, um, was able to play the game over a few, a few times, a few you know sessions on switch. And that's, that's really nice. Um, where, you know, you hear stories of people being frustrated for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then having to pay money on the toll, the toll, um, the toll calls for oh, gosh, lines, yeah. hands oh, you online. Used to have to do that. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so having a um, having hint book based in, in the game itself that that's, that knew where you are and can give progressive hints was a, a great feature that I think all adventure games should have. Um, if you have to go out to the internet and um, search or look at walkthroughs, you're going to get spoiled. It's, it's I think it's pretty close to impossible to do a walkthrough without finding stuff which was mm. um, inaccurate or you know, maybe the person did a hard mode walkthrough and you're, you're on easy mode and so you totally get lost and it's not clear. So being able to do, have it all self-contained is great. So yeah, I think I, I would want to keep going and refine it further for any game I worked on in the future and, you know, take the lessons we learned and, and make them even better. 48k ram which is a great um handle uh in chat says um this makes me wonder how much input did you have on ron's a uh, famous player's bill of rights um probably none um because he he wrote that without consulting with anyways this is his his stuff that he thought yeah. about and i think it was i mean i've used used it in talks I've given because I think they're really strong points. And um, when we did Thimbleweed Park, you know, we were very aware of, of a lot of those things to try to avoid. You know, it's another example of a game where you really can't get stuck. I mean, can't get you can't get to a point where you can't win it. Um, but it was more complex just because you had um, – multiple characters you're having to do things with them. So you, you really have multiple threads happening through it. Um, but I agree with them. Um, I think these are things that we, we, we did talk about a bunch of these when we did our early games um, because some of what we did with our, all of our graphic adventures were in opposition to how we saw, say, Sierra was doing theirs and you know, where you, you have multiple um, irrational deaths, um, or, yeah. you know, that I, it just, it, I really disliked the idea that you, I felt like I was playing against the designer rather than having the designer of the game wanting me to succeed. So I felt like they were sadistically throwing up roadblocks all the time. Mm. And it just felt, it would t for me, it took me out of the story. It's like, a, you know, that, that guy, whoever did that, um, I hate them now. <laughs> You know, have to, you know, the idea that you had to constantly save the game in order to um, avoid a death which that, which wasn't telegraphed in some way. Yeah. So like in Zach and in Indy um, or in Maniac Mansion, for example, you know, there are things that you push, don't push this button hmm. or something bad's going to happen and you push the button, then, you know, it, it becomes a joke. That's different than... Um, the example I use is I remember p picking up a broken piece of glass from a mirror in a Sierra game and cutting myself and dying <laughs> and, and thinking, well, in real life, um, I wouldn't, ha I could be, you know, careful that I don't cut myself, but I wouldn't have to worry about cutting myself and dying. You know? No, you'd hope. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just felt like that was unfair. Yeah, Unfair, no, I yes. think a lot of people agree with that um, now and at the time as well. Um, I'll just ask a couple more questions because uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I guess a couple of people have been mentioning, you know, how much they enjoyed Thimbleweed Park in, in the chat. So, uh, you know, it's worth kind of just digging into that a little bit. Um, and, and just what was that it like 
joining that project and because you know you, you were really more working on the design side of things is that right for that rather than programming so what what that shift was like well i was i did work on programming too yes um but um in some ways that was the opposite of the current games where because yeah. you know rather than it being totally in secret not even that the fact that we were doing this game um we're there it was a kickstarter project so you know that we wanted everyone to know about it and we wanted them to help to help pay for it <laughs> and um so the ron and gary showed me their kickstarter page you know a month or two before it went live so i had you know, i was able to um give feedback on it and you know say here you're missing this and and can you clarify that and you know just you know give some some suggestions um and then um made ron clear made it clear to ron that if there was an opportunity to work on the project i would love to do it um and that i guess during the fact that the that it was funded completely with within a very short time and then went way over um both myself and Mark Ferrari, um, who is our, mo- our main background artist, um, were kind of announced during, I think, a week or two in that we would join the project. And that was really fun. Um, so the fact that we were, I felt like much more ownership on the design, even though all the characters were, were established ahead of time, it, and the overall story flow was had been set up, although it changed at some point. Um, but actually, puzzles really weren't. So it was like, and here, there's a puzzle here to get something to happen. And then we had to come up with what the puzzle was going to be and how okay. to make it happen. Um, and um, you know, very involved in, in, like I said, the early, early, um, maybe three or four days of brainstorming in person. And then after that, um, Ron moved up to Seattle, so he wasn't local. And we, the rest of the brainstormings were um, virtual. Um, and then we were given different parts of the game to to own, essentially. So I would have you know this part, Jen, who's who's also our producer on Monkey Island, had the hotel and the underground, and I had most of the rest, I think, and. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I think I enjoyed that more that because I felt I had more ownership on the, on the game, mm. um, rather than this, rather, you know, rather than just being a coder. Um, and so if I did another game like that with Ron, I would hope to be more involved in, in the design. Um, what was I? I was I was just going to ask, and uh, then I'll get to a couple of questions in the chat, and then we'll kind of we'll leave it there. There's, I mean, there's lots more we could we could ask about, but um, yeah, I, I'm conscious of uh, giving you some time um, as well. Um, you, you talked about um, Thimbleweed Park in terms of it obviously being funded through Kickstarter. Uh, how did you feel that process went? Would you ever look to? fund a game through that way again um well the the plus is we got the funding yeah <laughs> um, we also got a, a huge really involved community i think it was eighteen thousand people were had contributed but once that happened you know we we all of our we did um weekly podcasts um there were bo- blog posts showing what, you know where we were showing examples and maybe getting feedback from people so they could actually you know, got to see the pro- the process of creating a game. Um, that was all really fun, and most of that work fell on Ron because he, had, you know, we do like an hour podcast, and then Ron had to spend eight hours editing it, and um, we do that weekly. So essentially, you know, one day a week was taken up on on that plus, you know, answering questions on the blog posts or, you know, on the forum that we had. Um, so the downside is that, that there was a lot more work that we had to do to keep everyone um, up to speed on what we were doing. Um, and um, 
all the feedback was not always appreciated, I think, or at least for me, <laughs> like, oh, you know, people, you know, it wasn't as bad as what happened with the people seeing the art style from, from Monkey Island then, and people, some people being very nasty about that. Um, but we, you know, still have people who are very opinionated about what we were creating. Um, I think there were some people who saw the initial quick starter images um, and then when we got more refined and had Mark on as the artist, if they got much, you know, um, you know, with the colors and the shadings and everything that he did, you know, made it, took it away from the much more retro, you know, 16 color type or eight color imagery to, you know, 100, you know, full color and, and with, you know, cheats, like actually doing rotations of objects rather than, doing pixel like ro rotations. And so you know, there's some people who wanted to be much more pure. I was going to say, let me guess some people had a, had an issue with that. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I, but I, I, I guess because I, I'm asking mainly because I suppose it was, uh, you know, there are a, a lot of these adventure games now that, you know, because they don't have big names attached, um, you know, they're an indie company. They do go through these kind of funding things. Um, now they do go through Kickstarter. It, it's less prevalent maybe than it was a while ago, but it still happens for a lot of these small companies. And I, I suppose, do you have any kind of tips for for people for company for developers trying to go through that way? Because uh, it can be, it's it's you know, it's not easy. It doesn't look like it's an yeah, easy process. Well, I I think I if I think looking at what we actually did with the Thimbleweed Park um, backers. Um, I think that was a really good model because it really, people really did feel like they were, they had ownership too, and they were brought along. And, and you know, I've seen examples of Kickstarter games where you might get occasional updates, but it, people weren't anywhere as involved. Like you know, we had a lot of content that came from from the, the supporters, you know, like everything from um, naming books yeah. to adding a couple pages of a book for the library or um, um, being able to to do voice recordings for an answer machine if, if people call their their number uh, on a phone in the game yeah, using I remember that, the, yeah. and although I think all those just really make the game make the whole experience much more inclusive and you like you feel like you're really participating in the game a lot more but you know the trade-off is that it's a lot of work on mm -hmm. our end too um, but of course we weren't going to come up with a thousand we had i mean the funny thing like people asking people to name come up with some appropriate names for books in um the bookshop the you know the myth the uh where the the woman what's her name you know the the one who um i don't know if she had a name oh madame marino is that her name um i have to look back at that marino. it's yeah, been a while since i've played it long. as well yeah <laughs> um but anyway we had to have Mark Ferrari keep on extending the the bookshop high taller and taller to get all the all the names in. Yes, the, I do remember that actually because you had to keep you could keep looking up and up. Yeah. 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 Madame um, Morena, apparently. Yeah. Right. Good. Glad I could remember. I'm not so good on names anymore, so um, I don't know if I ever was. But <laughs> <laughs> just like what? What was that? Um. So. But that, you know, it was fun to be able to ha do that and then turn it into a gag, really, by having it be much, much taller than the physical building looks like it could be. Um, so I, I'd i say look at look at what we did, realize how much extra work it is before you start promising it. But I think the benefits might be worth it. Um, but I think we would – I think there was some – some extra bonus things that we offered like people having their characters be in the game at a certain funding level um and a few other things that, that made it much more difficult because then we had to work with people to get their buy-off on on their representation or we had i think we had inventory objects you could describe and we had to work those into the gameplay if possible rather than mm -hmm. have it go tacked on 
Um, I'll, right, well, we'll I'll, I'll try and blitz through these last few questions. Uh, Lost Train Dude asks, um, on return, was there an internal debug tool you found most useful? Very specific question, Lost Train Dude, but yeah. Yeah, well, well the engine that we used have has all these debug tools that you can turn on. So you could either, you know, I never use this, you know, have breakpoints and actually see what's happening. Um, we, you know, could change variables on the fly. We could um, obviously use print statements. My, my favorite <laughs> debugging technique is you have a bunch of print statements and tell, tell where it is and where it felt, you know, where, where you are at this point. Um, we could do things like change. Um, we, part of the debug tool was, was setting up the lighting and scaling and it, be able to do that interactively while you're in the game. Um, and what else did it have? Oh, change, you know, change which actor's costume or, or anim animation was being either triggered or, or you know actually have, say, put the cook's costume on on um, Guybrush and then control things so you could trigger animations. Um, so a lot of that was, which I didn't have in, in previous games, made it a lot easier. Um, I, I, I just wanted to know, uh, what was Douglas Adams' reaction to Labyrinth after you made it? Did, he, did you hear from him once the game was made? Yeah, kind of. Um, I was in England for, I think, something pertaining to the game, and we ended up going out to dinner and, you know, unfortunately, I still hadn't gotten over my, my, my uh, being in awe of him. So I felt like I, he was so, so sweet and very um, um, accommodating. I think he was aware of how awkward I was feeling. Uh, so he tried to help. But um, I, I think I had shared some stuff with him. But I think once he, once we left the brainstorming session. He really, he wasn't all that into the game or active with the game. Sure. I don't okay. think, I don't think he played it actually. Um, a... Yeah. But, I mean, okay. I'm, I'm glad at least you had a, a little bit more interaction with him. Um, okay. Very quickly. Um, you mentioned you played, you played the trombone. Have you heard of a game called trombone champ? Yeah, I saw, I, I saw it. It was kind of fun. Yeah, have you I, had a chance to play it at all? I, I haven't played it. I, I watched several videos of it. I you know, people knowing that I that I do play right. had, you know, multiple people have sent me links to it. Um <laughs> and it, there's I think they do a pretty okay job of you know, showing one aspect of of having to play it, but um playing it in real life Mm. is is still different because you know there's no way to control your armature you know how you're holding your lips which control like you have your slide in position um you can play a whole bunch of notes in that same position by changing how tight your lips are uh, when you okay. when you make when you you're, you're actually you know spitting essentially into it um and so there so actually playing a real one is more complex mm. um and you're also moving your arm like this rather than just moving your mouse or whatever okay, a little down, bit. Yeah. But I think it's, you know, it's a fun, um, a really fun way to simulate it. I would hope it uh, playing a real one was more complex than that, to be honest. Otherwise, I'd definitely be giving <laughs> Trombo to go. Uh, yeah. This is a question we ask many people who come on the stream, if I remember to ask it. But what is your favorite chocolate bar? If you have one. Uh -huh. Well, I'd say I, I have a, I don't have a, I don't, I don't, I don't like any of the like Hershey's or mm. the, the, like the mainstream ones. So we usually end up going to either Trader Joe's. We have the store here that has a really good 72 to 78% dark chocolate. Um, that's about my range that I like. If it gets less than 72, I think it's too sweet and, and I don't like milk chocolate. If it goes above 80, then it sometimes it's like you're eating wax. Um, so, um, there's some that we've gotten at, I don't even remember the names at, at Whole Foods or through Amazon or, or, um, Trader Joe's, but I usually can't find anything I like at a standard grocery store. 
see. Okay, he's he's a man of of, of luxury, <laughs> yeah, um, or, or good taste, I guess you should say. Uh, I, I mean, can, I, I I can go downstairs and look in our cupboard and and give you a name of one or two of the bars. <laughs> If you want to, feel free to. I mean, maybe you you could do that once once you come back on on chat. Maybe just so I'm I, I'm not forcing you to do that now, but please do. Uh, <laughs> we'd love to know. Um, and I guess just what 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 are you working on at the moment? What 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 have, what have you got going on? We we had, um, I think Duke of Germany also said something about, uh, you know, will you continue making games in the spirit of Thimbleweed Park and Monkey Island, um. Is that kind of the direction you're going in at the moment or, or what are you up to? Um, well, I feel like this is a break between between yeah. me, big projects. So um, if Ron ends up doing another adventure game, he knows I'd want to be a part of it. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure it would be in that same vein. Um, nothing's not, – I mean, if we were doing something, I probably couldn't say, but we aren't yet. So um, I don't have to lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, the – um, I'm going back to the Rube, the Rube works, the Rube over yes. game. And, um, as, especially for Mac, um, as the OS is advanced at some point, it, it stopped working. Okay. So we had to go back to the code base from nine year, 10 years ago, literally, cause it, it came out nine years ago and, you know, fix things and bring it up and try to get it to a newer version of unity so we could actually compile it again. And I actually got it to compile, so I just have to test it now. And then, and the the VR version, I think Google changed some parameters that we have to match um, by recompiling it with a new with the current version of Android. Um, and you know, so this is like housekeeping stuff, really. Sure. Um, then my wife um, has. It's a writer and a couple of books that she wrote um, went out of print and we got bought the art and rights back to the art for the art and we're doing a P, we're doing a, um, ebook versions of those so I'm in the process of going through those and having to replace fonts with fonts that can be published or embedded um, and also I think those are the main two things right now. Um, there are some other games which I had wanted to, you know, small things based on her books that I was doing a while back, which I could go back and redo that. But those are all you know, relatively small projects compared to, you know, it's really just me working on it. And, wow. and lots of hikes and <laughs> and being able to, to not, you know, have breakfast when I want rather than having to match it up with the times of meetings. And, um, you know, so all oh, that's good. Oh, I'm very jealous, David. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to be doing yeah. that. Um, yeah. Well, in which case, I will leave. I will leave you now to do such things as go on hikes and maybe take Gracie out for a walk and so on. Um, yeah. But I really, really appreciate you giving us the time to just chat about everything. Thank you so much. Yeah, hap and happy to come back whenever you you want. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm sure. We, I'm sh wh whatever you do in the horizon. Yeah, please do keep in touch and. Uh, yeah. Let's I, I want. I wanted to say also that you know. Previously, the way to find me was on Twitter, and I uh, pretty much disconnected from that. Yeah. I, I can occasionally look to see if I have a message, but the two places where I spend my my social media time now are um, Post News. Um, it's a new one which there's a waiting there's like a two hundred fifty thousand person waiting list, but they're letting people in pretty fast now. Okay, um, that's really fun. Um, but there's not much of a gaming community yet. So you guys should all join when you have a chance. All right. Um, and then also on, on Mastodon, I'm I'm um, David B. Fox at mastodon.gamedev.place. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Everyone's yeah. leaving Twitter, aren't they? So. Yeah. I, I, I think it's um, it's getting scarier and scarier there. So I, I've just kind of emotionally been detaching from it. Um, it's frustrating because I really liked being on there. Yeah. But I feel like I can't support what's happening now. So I I totally understand that I'm I'm interested in this post.news because I hadn't heard about that. So I will check that out as well. But Yeah, um, just go there and get on, get on, add your name to the waiting list. Okay. All right. Well put put a little word in for me, David, and then <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, um, brilliant stuff. Yeah, thank you again. And uh, we'll put those links 
in on the chat so people can follow you. And um, yeah, have a have a lovely rest of your day. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.